it now. Got it. All right, Devin, what's up? Talk to me. What are, you, what are, we, what are we doing today? We're recapping a little bit from last week, and then I think we wanted to add to it a little bit too. So with our how to pick a trainer. Okay. I think, um, well, I guess just to recap, we talked about like watching the trainer, kind of observing like how they interact with their clients, um, talking to their clients, um, like making sure they're attentive when they're when their clients are training, like they're not watching TV, they're not texting, talking to other people. Um, they have like a good connection slash work balance. Um, so I think those were our big ones. I like the, I like the idea of the recap. That was very professional. Thank you very much. I would just start blabbering on. People would be like, wait, wait what's this guy talking about? They didn't see the previous video. So, so what else? How do you want to expand this topic today? What are, what are some other things that people should look for for a trainer? What other yeah. topics of discussion are there? Um, I think one other thing that came to mind was like seeing what type of people that trainer trains. Like if they train a lot of older people and you're a competitive power lifter, like it's probably not the trainer for you. So I think kind of looking at the main demographic that they work with and picking a trainer based off of that um, in combination with making sure that you like your personalities mesh well. Um, I think those are two really big things. Yeah, it makes sense. Cause I, as of right now, I'm back on the dating scene and I'm on uh, these dating websites. And I saw this beautiful woman. So I click on her profile and she says, I only date guys who are six foot above, drive pickup trucks, drink Budweiser. And what was the other thing she wanted? And listen to country music. I'm five foot nine. I drive a Toyota Corolla. I drink light beer cause it's less filling, but tastes great. And, uh, I don't have any tattoos. I think she wants one of guys with tattoos, and I have no tattoos, right? So it, even though something looks good, you got to make sure it's the right fit, regardless of whether it's a trainer or not. That was just a weird, a perfect example of that, right? Something seems like they're the best looking trainer in the gym, or they've got all the hot clients. But then you look at what they what they are and what they do and who they train, and if it's not good fit for you, it's not good fit for you. Mm -hmm. Perfect example. So besides that, what was the thing that do you remember the thing I said to you that David Green has suggested that a train a person does the idea of observing, not stalking. Yeah. Right? I'm, not trying, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on David Green here, but the idea of observing people from a distance. Do you remember that? Do you want to expand upon that idea? Yeah, well, I guess like I think I hit on the main things I wanted to hit on with that as far as as like how their interactions with the clients are. Um, the types of exercises that they're giving their clients, like if they're doing everything with a weighted vest or on a BOSU ball, like, the, or like, yeah. <laughs> sorry, that's like that completely involuntary facial reaction. I'm sorry, continue to go. Um, like if they're just using a lot of gimmicks in their training, not that there's anything wrong with a weighted vest or a BOSU ball in the right context, but I think if they're using, if they have to use a lot of like, like tricks and things like that, I would just be a little hesitant with that type of training. Or maybe you're the kind of person who wants gimmicks. Maybe that's what you want. You know, maybe you want, you, maybe you want your trainer to have you show up in clown shoes. I don't know. Whatever it is that, that floats your boat makes the hour seem like it goes by a little faster and a little bit more enjoyable. The key thing is you got to find the right trainer for you. Right. Did you want to add anything else to our recap? No, I mean, I think, I think one thing I always think people have to understand is personal training is personal training. It is not working on Petri dishes in a laboratory. So it, it does come down to a great degree, the personality and the person. Exercise science, the laws of physical adaptation are fairly consistent. The reason why you're with a trainer is because there's something about that person that helps you apply that information. We talked last week about the, uh, the guy with the encyclopedias in his attic, right? It, it, there's something about that individual helps you apply the information more, more consistently and to a better degree. So that's the one thing I would say to people is make sure your personality and the personal trainer's personality mesh. If they're the kind of person who throws compliments around like manhole covers, then you might not want to work with that person if you're someone who's very emotionally sensitive, someone who needs a lot of positive feedback. There's, again, there's nothing wrong with hard, mean, tough, nasty trainers. Some people are motivated by that. Other people are not. Other people need different types of reinforcement. 
that's the one thing I want people to understand is we don't want people to respond to, to trainers because of their body. Likewise, we don't want people to respond to trainers because they may do something that you do or do not like. You got to find the right fit. And by why, and a lot of that comes out not even their training tactics and style, but the person themselves. Right. Right. So there you go. So I think we've covered, I think we destroyed that topic. Uh, let's, let's move on to something else. What else we, we're, we're going to cover today? Were we going to talk to me about blowing calorie deficits and stuff like that? Well, the concept of when people say, when people claim like, oh, you have to eat more to lose more. Or like when they say they're not eating enough is creating a weight loss plateau. And I think there's a couple things that are, that can occur in those situations, but I think that's what the next thing we were going to touch on. Okay. Could you just like start rolling with that? Because I just have to digest I, the disgust in my stomach of yeah. you're, you're, you have to eat more to lose more and all that stuff. Can you just kind of get it rolling and then I can kind of get over this bad spell that I'm in right now? Yeah. So the first thing is like, for example, like let's say an 170 pound person, let's say like to lose weight 10 times body weight. So let's say they have to eat 1700 calories a day. So for the week, that's 11,900 calories, if I did my math correctly. And then, so there's, or someone like trying to do, let's say that same person tries to do a 1200 calorie a day diet five days a week. And then two days, let's say they're either so hungry from the 1200 calorie a day diet, or they go out to eat and think that weekends don't count. Then let's say they end up eating 4,000 calories on two days. So that's 14,000 calories for the entire week. So here, here, this person thinks they're on a 1200 calorie a day diet when in reality they're, they have the, the, whether it's the weekend or overeating due to being so hungry because of dieting or deprivation or, um, or maybe they justify, Oh, I'm so good during the week. I can have this and that on the weekends. Um, and then end up just erasing their deficit over the weekend and and so like when eating more can actually help them lose let's say they're feeling more full and satisfied with their meals on their 1700 calorie day diet they're um they're not justifying because they know they're eating enough during the week and they can actually maybe fit some of that weekend stuff within 1700 calories uh like whether it's like social outings or maybe like a couple drinks um and so basically I think that higher calorie amount initially allows them to be consistent for longer, allowing them to actually lose weight. So I think that's like, if people want numbers, I think that's, that's the easiest way to put it in a way that um, you can really see the numbers and see how initially eating more can help you actually lose more. A perfect explanation. I always say you can lie to yourself, you can lie to your trainer, but you can't lie to your pants. And no matter how mad you get at what actual portion sizes of food, because they are depressing. If you look at the actual portion sizes, what food probably should be, it, it really makes you sad. This is this last weekend was my birthday, and I had a Carvalanche from Carvel, which is like their version of a Dairy Queen Blizzard. It was 1,800 calories. I ate that in under 10 minutes. So based on my weight loss calories, I basically had a banana left in me. My diet that day, if I was trying to lose weight, which I wasn't because my birthday, I was coming up for air. But if I was trying to lose weight, I would have had a cargo lunch and a banana. How long is that going to last? Not very long. No. Look, the law of thermodynamics is the law of thermodynamics, whether people like it or not. And, and I agree with you. I, I, where, does this, where does this concept of eat more to lose more come from? You're right. Because what happens is, People will go, say, on a very low-calorie diet for 10 days straight. The problem is, especially if you're a small person, a very low-calorie diet is still not a huge deficit. Where if you cut 500 calories out of a 3,000-calorie-day diet, not a big deal. You cut out 500 calories out of a 1,500-calorie-day diet, and we're talking malnutrition. Mm -hmm. The problem is people go on these, these very low-calorie diets. The problem is also they're smaller people or they don't, are not as active. So maybe their multiplier isn't even 10. Maybe their multiplier is current body weight times eight or nine. And what happens is they have one quote unquote bad weekend, one big weekend where they have the car avalanche and then something on top of it. And they literally can blow the whole calorie deficit in a day or two. That, that car is a perfect example of how easy it is to blow a calorie deficit. 1800 calories in 10 minutes. And it tasted awesome. And I would do it again. Yep. 
right? So I, I agree with you. It's not like there's some magical thing. First off, the thermic effect of food. The other thing I had for my, my birthday a couple of days earlier was I ate two pounds of bone and ribeye steak. The next morning I woke up, I had the worst, the thing you taught me about, I had the worst meat sweats you could possibly imagine. I was drinking ice water to cool down my engine. And what was amazing is that, that burn, that heat effect, people think, oh, that's your metabolism getting stuck. No, it's, it's called you're digesting two pounds of meat like a, like a lion on the Serengeti. That's what the heat, but even that thermic effect of food is minimal, right? It's like, I think it's for every 100 calories of protein you eat, the thermic effect it requires like 10 to 20 calories to metabolize it. So for every 100 calories of protein you eat, you're getting maybe 80 to 85 calories in. That's still not that much of a difference. So it's, so it's not that thermic effect of food that's causing you to get, lose more weight by eating more. It's just the fact that you're probably not blowing it on one or two days down the road. I think the other thing is, is besides the fact that you're not blowing it down the road, you're not blowing it out of the water. I think, I think the other effect is, is, well, I guess that goes along with it. You're more full on the days that you're eating, so therefore you're less likely to go off on a binge. That thermic effect of food really isn't covering it. The, the math doesn't add up, right? So, so I would say, there was something else in my head I can't remember, so just go off and I'll try to remember what, I was gonna write it down and I forgot. So it's not the thermic effect. Go ahead, Devin, take over. So like another thing is like, if let's say someone starts um, like planning their meals ahead of time and are more intentional with eating breakfast, lunch, dinner, um, and, and eating actual meals. Cause I think a lot of times right. what happens is people don't think they're eating a lot, but they're actually snacking or grazing a lot. Okay. And those foods are typically low in protein. So they're not very filling. So they probably don't feel like they're eating a lot. But once they start eating, eating bigger meals with more protein, maybe more vegetables, um, just higher volume foods in general, and then now they think they're eating more, maybe they're eating more food volume and they're eating more protein, but um, overall it helps them actually eat fewer calories and again, lose weight. So I remember what I was going to say. There's a thing called NEAT, it's non-exercise activity thermogenesis. It's essentially the amount of calories you burn while not specifically exercising. Like, look at me, I'm all twitchy. I have very high levels of meat. But when I'm on a low calorie diet for too long, my meat levels drop in the toilet. Now, I've heard people make this analogy before and I noticed it myself. I blink slower when I'm on too low of a calorie diet. Someone in the gym commented to me, I don't bounce on my ball as much as I normally do. And that's because it's the summer and I'm on lower calories and my weight is lower. So my non-exercise activity, people don't realize this, but when you putter around, when you twitch around, that can burn a lot of calories. Even in someone like me who's very neurotic and twitchy, when my calories are low for a long period of time, my meat drops into the toilet. For example, there was this woman who used to work at the gym I used to work at, and she was one of these people who was overweight and did a lot of cardio because she used to eat a lot and move a lot. And I remember one day I was walking around trying to get my vitamin D levels and stoke my insecurities and I was walking around my shirt off and I was walking really slow. And I just I had no energy. My, my calories were really low. My body fat was really low. And I'm sitting there and I'm just walking around the, the neighborhood like really, really slow. And she started trucking past me. She was all cocky, like she was Smokey and the Bandit. And she's trucking down, looking at me and my abs and just like laughing to herself. Again, because she wasn't obviously in a calorie deficit. She had enough energy to supply her needs. When your meat levels drop down from being in a prolonged calorie deficit, your activity drops down to almost nothing. And if you're someone like me, who normally burns a lot of energy through twitching, and all of a sudden you start going into low fuel levels, your non-exercise activity level goes down. Whereas when I start eating, like today my client Vanessa King made me this just phenomenal sourdough bread loaf, and I was pounding that thing all day long, sharing it with people. I've been moving around like crazy. I was walking dogs at the animal shelter. The dog's like, dude, you need to calm down, right? Whereas five days earlier, I had almost no energy because my calories were so low. Yeah. And part of that's psychological. I don't know if that bread necessarily absorbed into my muscles that quickly, but I also had a little more to eat yesterday also. So I think that probably is more of a factor. But that's a huge thing is that non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And one of the things you do find in lean people is they tend to burn a lot more calories, quote, unquote, at rest not through metabolism, but just the fact that they're constantly moving throughout the day. 
when you eat less, your NEAT drops down. When you eat more, your NEAT goes up. You Again, you don't lose more by eat more by defying the law of thermodynamics. You lose more by eating more probably by not binging later on, which is so easy. Calorie-dense food is so easy to overconsume, especially in our country, but also because of the fact you move a lot more just unconsciously. Yeah. Yeah, I think even, uh, like, let's say someone increased their calories by 150 calories and they put that in carbs as their pre-workout, like, how much their gym performance could go up in, in just with that, that little increase in calories. So if they're eating more and then they're lifting with better quality, then they can lose more body fat. So, again, like, eating more to lose more. Um, but, yeah. And then I think another... Another thing, and this is probably less common and might not apply to people watching this, but people who are just chronic dieters who just like chronically super low calories um, and basically have put themselves in a situation where let's say they really do only eat 1200 calories a day and that's what they end up um, like that's what ends up maybe not that low, but something pretty low. And then that ends up being their maintenance because they've um, really just down-regulated their metabolism so much. Oh, no, I, I get it. Like, for example, one of the things I found is that when people engage in moderate exercise programs, you know, we're talking about like is 70 to 150 minutes of moderate cardio exercise per week, lifting weights three days a week. I've talked about this before. One exercise your back, one exercise your chest, one exercise in front of the thigh, one exercise your back of the thigh, one exercise your biceps, one exercise your biceps, one exercise your shoulders. Right? When they, when they get in those moderate act exercise uh, programs, it actually tends to make their appetite go down. Also, people engage in shorter bursts of higher intensity exercise. I find that tends to make their appetite go down. The problem is, is that's not always the way. People will always operate in a, in a concept of traditional moderation. So what they do is they say, oh, well, 7,500 steps a day has been scientifically proven to help elder people live longer and better. I'm going to do 10,000. No, I'm going to do 12,000. I'm going to do 15,000. Then they get in these massive step amounts and these massive amounts of exercise to where now all of a sudden the exercise is no longer blunting the hunger response. It's increasing it. And if you can exercise at the intensity and volume of a Michael Phelps, then you can eat a lot and exercise a lot. But I find most people miss that, that, that sweet spot. Like the lady I was talking about who was, who was, who was trucking past me on the walk, the, the history behind that was one time she got really mad at me because she said to me, why well, do two hours of spin a day, right? And I can't lose weight. And when I asked her what she was eating, she was eating two pounds of grapes a day, all right? Now I understand Kate, grapes aren't calorie dense, but two pounds of grapes a day. And that was just like to start. So, so at a certain point, Moderate exercise, yes, it blunts your, cat, your, your appetite. You know, small amounts of high intensity exercise, probably because you get nauseous or something, that'll blunt your, your appetite. But if you start getting one of these crazy exercise routines where you go from all to not, from nothing to everything, that could also drive your hunger. And, yeah. and, and, and so a lot of times you got to be careful with that too. It, it, it really does come down to knowing the way the body works and understanding how it is that you're violating that in some way. And understand that for, again, the average person that we train, the idea that they can outwork a bad diet just, it just isn't reasonable. Right. Right. Yeah. So to, to sum up the, like eating more to lose more, it would be like eating more to avoid like weekend binges, um, helping with the neat and then like potentially like the down, like avoiding that that really extreme down-regulated metabolism. So would you say there's anything else, like other reasons? If there are, I don't know what they are. I mean, really, I mean, those, those seem to be the big three things. If everything comes down to, you know, everything comes down to, you have to be in a calorie deficit. And the biggest issue I find, and I, I did a video about this not too long ago, I'd say 90% of the time people aren't in calorie deficits. It's accidental. Yeah. I only find there's really, I mean, I'm talking about the chronic lying person who really needs psychological help, you know, that, that's, that's, that's sneaking food, but we call it the Ginny Sack syndrome. Do you ever see the guy, the, what was it, the, not the good fellas, what are they calling it? The Sopranos, where the head mob guy's wife, the second he walks out the door, is eating hidden candy bars in the basement. 
you know, that's a very, I, I know that's a bad stereotype of the slothful, overweight person, but I'm telling you, the guy, and I know you've had a lot of experience like I have, that represents a very, very small percentage of the people. I'm going to people who are volitionally lying about what they're eating. I actually find that fit people tend to lie more about what they eat to save their fit reputations. Um, it's like in Greece, too, and they kept telling Michael Carrington, you know, I have a reputation to protect. So I know a lot of fit people that eat and drink like maniacs, but they won't tell people that because they've got this, this healthy food reputation. What I find is 90% of the times is that people are so awful at portion sizes and how many calories are actually in what they're eating versus what they're actually burning off. It, it, that seems to be the main, main push behind where the problem is for people who have the money and the time to worry about being overweight. And yeah, and that's where it comes. The binges do not help with that. The drop in non-exercise activity thermogenesis that helps with the problem as far as your calories burning out going down. So yeah, it's, it's this again, this eating more to lose more, it's just a way to manage that a little bit more accurately. You yeah. just gotta be careful when you're eating more, that means that there's more opportunities for you to misjudge portion sizes. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a great uh, graphic of what a tablespoon of peanut butter looks like. And people are all, I'm not getting overweight because of peanut butter. Peanut butter is really calorie dense. And it tastes really, really, really good. And if you're eating things like nuts and nut butters, all the kind of things you give football players to bulk up, yeah, it's very easy to actually overeat. And it's very easy for one, one quote, unquote, bad weekend to blow a calorie deficit, especially in a smaller person, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think there was, like, just talking about, like, being unaware, like, accidentally overeating, like, little things that people do, like, kind of going on, um, going off of what I said with the grazing, I think there was this study and it looked at people who had the option to pick a whole donut or pieces of donuts. Are you familiar with this? No, because I've never seen pieces of a donut. Usually when there's a donut, it's in pieces after it's gone through my mouth. I, I've never seen a donut in pieces because it's just, it's, it's gone. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I know. I've never heard this. Please go ahead. It, it was basically the people that went for the donut pieces actually ended up consuming more calories than the people who just took the actual donut because they, because they ended up eating more because they didn't really realize because it was in, in such small doses. People say like, oh, I'm not a big eater. It's like, well, you're not a big eater all at once, but you probably graze, graze more than you realize or you have maybe more snack foods which are low in protein so i don't know Devin, this though you do know so my eyes got really big because i've never heard of that before and i think that's awesome uh -huh. i actually once trained a guy who had to get rid of all the hundred calorie snack packs out of his house and get rid of all the snack size things of candy and i said to him well, isn't the whole purpose of those things to help you control portion sizes and he said he used to literally get high off of the idea of ripping open the pack. He's like a little kid on Christmas morning, right? And he said also he used to rationalize to himself it was only a snack pack thing. So he'd eat like three or four snack packs, and in the end he'd want to eat like four or 500 calories. One because of the rush he got from opening the package, but two also because he just he rationalized in his own head. This really isn't that, much, that much food. Mm -hmm. So it's funny you bring that up because like I, literally that now makes that guy make sense. That brings it all together. I've never heard of that study. If I had, it was probably something I heard of years ago and forgot about it. It but was it, a long very long true. Okay. Yeah, I tried Googling it again yesterday and I couldn't find it, but. Um. Well, if you can't find it on Google, maybe, maybe, maybe it just, it, maybe it just, the study got blown up or something like that because I thought everything's on Google. We'll find it. We'll make it a mission to find it and we'll give people the link in the show notes. How about that? Okay. Yeah, but that, that doesn't surprise me. Again, a lot of it's, it's amazing the things that you, 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 me, every other person on earth, can rationalize in our head, absolutely. And then that doesn't, that's why I always wonder like, why would all these innovations and snack packs and all this stuff, why haven't people been losing weight? And, and maybe that's why, maybe because when you do it, you can kind of, like look, you know what the most evil thing on the earth is? Those little Lindor truffles, you ever see those things? Those things get people into trouble. You know the ones where you twist and they come out? Yeah. I, I know that some people can eat one of them and then walk away. It usually takes them 10 minutes to eat one of them so they can savor it. But I can see how that could get someone in trouble. Oh, it's only one. And next thing you know, you're like a thousand calories in the hole. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's one thing that like with my clients when we're working on nutrition, like one big thing that I think a, a lot of people have found success with is realize, like, like stepping away from the snacks and really just having three big meals with however much protein they would need evenly divided throughout the day. But um, like three big high protein meals with minimal snacking. And that's just been such a big game changer for them as far as like managing their appetite, managing their calories and um, just being a lot more aware of, of how much they're actually eating and even feeling like they're actually able to eat more um, because it's in larger quantities all at once. What's interesting you say that because I have clients who go do business in Europe for extended periods of time. And the one thing I'd say to them is, you know, there's that concept of the French paradox that the French eat a lot of fatty, rich foods, but don't have as much of what they used to. I don't know what it is now, but they used to not have the same weight problem as Americans. And the one thing one of my clients observe is they don't snack, that there is a snack time in France, but it's mainly for children. And usually it's a small piece of chocolate or something like that. But that is interesting you say that because part of the culture is, People don't snack. I always tell the story about when the Baylocks went to Korea, right? And they, they got food from the, 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 the authentic Korean roadside vendor. And they started eating and walking. And an entire city block of like Seoul just stopped and stared at them like they were lunatics. Like who eats and walks? Yeah. Right? Like you eat, you walk, you savor, you move on with your life. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with coffee in Europe. Apparently, European coffee tends to taste richer because they brew it for longer, because the idea is you're supposed to sit there for a while and drink it, not drink it, and then go about doing the 7,000 other. How many times in our country you see people walk around with the coffee cup, right? Like, it's almost yeah. as all, yeah, and they're like, and I'm walking, I'm doing it, baby. And I got my phone here, and I'm walking, and I'm doing it, and I'm drinking it, right? The coffee's like always with something. It's never like, there's the coffee, there's me, I'm drinking my coffee, get the hell away from me, right? It's like, I got to use this coffee like fuel to go do the next 10,000 things I got to do. Right. So it's it, that, that's actually interesting to say that because having been in that quote, foreign country where the weight problem tends not to be as common, they don't snack. Yeah. So that, that's actually very interesting that you say that because that, again, Devin, you're like putting things together in my head that I've never thought of before today and everything's starting to come together. It's like, we've always been taught like snacking is not only something of you, it's a rule and a right and an entitlement. It's yeah. like Social Security and Medicare and they're snacking. Yeah. Right? And that's just the way it's got to be. And it seems like that's right, because when you eliminate snacking, what do you eliminate? You eliminate calorie intake. You, you not only that, but you had, you had corrected me on something why I got it wrong in one of our things about this concept of when leptin drops, ghrelin goes up, right? So when leptin, the hormone leptin goes down, when you go on a diet for too long, your body goes into like an alarm, like, oh my God, I'm starving to death. And one of the hormones it has is, is a hormone called ghrelin, which drives hunger. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because I remember one time Lyle McDonald was talking about this, about his dogs, that his dogs don't have watches, but they know exactly when it's time to eat. They start whining and crying about five minutes before it's dinner time. And probably a lot of that's doing like kind of a, a training of those systems, that their stomach knows exactly when food's supposed to be in them and food's not supposed to be in them. Right. And maybe that's another big thing. of it. It's just, it, it almost habits like a Pavlovian dog, but it's a Pavlovian 45 year old business executive, right? It, it's, it's like the bell, it's training you. This is when you eat, mm-hmm. right? And if there's food anywhere in between there, you don't eat that because this is not the time to eat. And that can be a big part of cutting calories. Not only are you eliminating three, 400 calories a day in terms of snacks, but you are literally in big picture training your brain when to eat and when not to eat. Right. And so I, again, I didn't even think about that, but that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think timing, eating, Eating meals at the same time is a really good way to kind of train your appetite because you do start to get hungry around the same times that you eat. Whereas if you're constantly just like, oh, am I hungry? Am I hungry? Like it's like you you're gonna be potentially eating every two seconds. Like if you just the second you think of food. Um, That's what drives me nuts about the people, they always say they're instinctive eaters. And then you watch them and their instincts are all right. They're, they're like, you know, I could be, I could go on and say, I'm, I'm Shank, I'm the instinctive stockbroker. And I could blow your life savings in 10 minutes because my instincts when it comes to stocks suck. But if you had a really, really good financial person who's been doing finances for decades and has really good instincts, they could invest your money instinctively and probably do fairly well. I mean, yeah, they want to do research and stuff like that, but I would look at the same research and lose all your money. Whereas they've trained themselves over time to have well, good instincts. 
So that's another thing, the instinctive approach to dieting. Well, whose instincts? Because if I use my instincts, I'd be eating all day long. And if you watch TV, your instincts are going off every five seconds to eat something. Yeah. My instinct is always to grab something to eat if I see it. But, you know, I certainly know there's a word. Habits which train me, this is what I eat, this is what I eat, and this is how much I eat of, of certain things. Right. So absolutely, I like that idea. Of if, if, and yeah, we always talk about these things as tactics and strategies. For some people, this is where why you and I are awesome. I'm going to pat ourselves in the back because we're not trying to be gurus. Saying, look, here are a series of tactics that may or may not work for you. Here's some of the people we've seen them work for, and here's how they work. If you're the kind of person who having a snack throughout the day helps you eat less at your meals or keep you from being a food day, then that's a great strategy for you. But if you're struggling with that, if that's not working for you, here's another tactic or strategy that you can try that may work well for you. Like the idea, again, of not eating between meals. You know, someone can always say, well, can 50 million French people be wrong? Well, unfortunately, quite frequently they can, right? But sometimes, and this is a Scott Abel quote, sometimes success does leave clues. And this might be something you might want to look in. This might be. This is something you're going to want to look into if you're struggling and not succeeding with the current whatever you're doing. I think that's one thing I always take out of these, 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 these conversations with us is the idea of context and nuance. And how does any given thing we're saying apply to an individual? Like the idea of eat more to burn more. That may very well backfire on a great deal of people. And then for the idea of not binging, for the idea of improving meat, and for the idea of, what was the third thing we said? It was neat, not binging, and, uh, oh, avoiding extreme approaches to dieting. Yeah. yeah. The idea of that may be a really good idea, right, to eat more and, and, and lose weight. So that's the main thing. And that's, people always say to me, how do I avoid being so confused by all the information out there? And understand, and you've said this before, that two things could be, opposite but both correct depending on the person you're applying them to mm -hmm. right and then that's a, that's a I like that that should, that's a good theme for people to think about should i or should i not eliminate snacking from my diet yeah. am i the kind of person where snacking is going to help me eat less over the long term if the answer is yes then you should snack if the answer is no then try the approach of not snacking between meals and that could be a game changer absolutely yeah so, and something i teach to my clients who are who do like to snack is like you you if you're trying to be in a calorie deficit you don't want to just snack to prevent hunger you snack to almost use it as a bridge to hold you over until the next meal so it's not something you do just as like oh i'm gonna get hungry let me grab a few snacks it's like if you if you need something because you're so hungry that you would probably overeat at your next meal that's when you have something between meals so the there's a difference, like there it's context. So I think that's something important to keep in mind if you're trying to assess whether while you're trying to lose weight, if you should be snacking, I think that's something important to consider. And also the thing to consider too are the three Ds, right? <laughs> well, I, well, think about how much of snacking could be eliminated by the three Ds. And I know most people know the six Ds of dodgeball, but can we go over again the three Ds, the three Devon Ds? It's kind of cool because your name begins with a D. Yeah. Right? It'd be kind of cool if your last name was like Donaldson, Devin Donaldson, then that'd be five Ds. But maybe you should consider a name change. I don't know. I like, I like Peterson. Here's the deal. Can you tell them again the three Ds? So say someone tries to do this approach to where they're going to eliminate snacking, but they wind up getting a craving of some type. What are the three Ds? What do they do, Devin? Delay, distract, and deal. So delay, set a timer for, let's say, 15 minutes. Distract, go do something else like clean around your house, call a friend, go for a walk, find something, I don't know, play a computer game, something else, and then make a deal with yourself. Like, okay, do I still want this cookie? Yes, I'm going to have, or let's say, let's be realistic. I'm going to have two cookies and um, a protein shake mm -hmm. and like pair it with a little protein. So it's actually going to be a little more filling. And, yes. Yeah. So make a deal like, okay, I do still want this. So I'm going to have a moderate portion paired with a protein source. And another thing helps like having it sitting down at a table, enjoying it, like not just, I don't know, walking around outside, like, I don't know, at the mall. Let me grab it. Let me grab an Annie Ann's pretzel and be like walking around the mall and like not really enjoy it. Right. Um, 
No, well, no, because that, that, that makes perfect sense to me in the sense of, I also want to say that if, say, to our, our watchers out there, if you do blow it, if that two cookies turns to four to six and eight, number one, having it with a protein shake or a source of protein will help a lot, right? It makes it go a lot further because the, the satiating value of protein. If you do blow it, please understand that everyone blows it from time to time, especially in America where there's so much food that's so easy to get access to and it's so tasty. Right. Think about Thanksgiving dinner. You can fill yourself up, but if someone brings dessert out, your body finds room, or at least your brain finds room. So please understand that if you don't successfully implement the three Ds, right, which are, again, delay. What is it again? Delay, distract, delay, and deal, right? Or delay, distract, deal. Do it again. Delay, distract, deal. Delay, distract, deal. Understand that no one given meal or one given binge defines your diet and that the difference I see in clients that succeed and, and fail are it's not that they don't ever have bad moments with their diet, but it doesn't become the new habit. It's a bad moment. It's isolated. They admit it. And then they move on with their life and get back to their regular habits. Right. But look, the other day I had, a, I had a nail in my tire, right? And the tire had to be replaced because the nail was more on the sideboard instead of the tread. I didn't then immediately go out with a knife and stab the next three tires. So if you think about that one tire is one day or one bad binge or one, you know, what's the thing about one day? You don't go out and blow the next three days because one tire burst. You just made a bad problem worse. So instead of replace one hundred, two hundred dollar tire, now I have, now you have a six hundred and eighty dollar repair bill. No, scratch that. An eight hundred and eighty dollar repair bill. Now all four tires gotta go. So think about that. If you have one flat tire, only a moron would go out there and stab. Well, I'm making the computer shake. Only a moron would go out there and stab the next three. Why would you do that with your diet? Right. If you have one bad day, if you fail the three Ds, why are you going to go out and blow the next three or four days? Get back on. And you know what? Good. You just learned something. Or you know what? Good. You just got a chance to walk on the wild side. Now get back to, to regular. Don't be Peter Pan. You're not a child for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah, had your one moment. Now let's move back on to adult things and get back to the calorie deficits so we can achieve our goals. Right. Oh, I think it's important. We got two minutes left. Football has the two-minute warning. So should we. <clears throat> Excuse me. What is the summation of this video? What's the most you got out of this, Kevin? Um, well, main thing, like the recap of finding a trainer, watching what they're doing, making sure it's a good fit for you, um, and then how eating more – can help you lose more. So eating more initially can actually help you just be more consistent with your cal calorie deficit. And that's really the main way that that works. Um, and then I think the big one that you said, like if you get one flat tire, it doesn't mean you have to make all your other tires flat. Like you just, you get back to your normal habits and you move on. Well, for me, the big thing about all our discussing about trainers did absolutely nothing for me because I don't need a trainer. Right. I mean, cause I am a trainer. I mean, I have people, I, I, you know, talk to people about my program design and stuff like that. So for me, I think that's very valuable for the viewers. What I personally like me got out of this today was I love the fact that we were able to do a three part definitive organized answer as to how eating more burns more. Again, it's not existing in, 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 uh, in, in a fluid space. It's not some other dimensional realm that we're talking about here. It's very specific reasons, scientific reasons, why eating more helps you burn more. I, I also like the idea that the, the two big things were that organized system behind eating more, burning more, and also the idea of not snacking. We've gotten so caught up in this idea, and maybe that's why intermittent fasting works so well for some people and doesn't work well for others. So intermittent fasting, people won't tell you that, but it's true. It's because, again, it gets you a set defined meal time and trains you both mentally and physically to know this is when you eat. For some people, it results in binges. Some people, it doesn't. But th those are the two huge things I got out of today. I really like – it really brought that kind of client in France thing all together for me after it happened 10, 15 years ago. That, that, that was huge. And I think that could help a lot of people out there who think that they need to snack between meals. Maybe you don't. Maybe that's not the best approach for you. Yeah. So that's it for, we're not going to get cut off this time, Dan.